Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church Midweek Devotional Bible Study. I'm the Reverend Lukata M. Jumbe. I'm the pastor here at Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church that is based in Princeton, New Jersey. We come together on Wednesdays at 1230 to study the Word of God. We've been doing this about... Uh, about two years, Sharon. I also need to check to see what our anniversary for this one. I think it was that maybe it might be today, because I think it was shortly after we started the um, the morning prayer. Uh, every Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. we started the Bible study. Soon, soon after that, if not, I think the next the next week, if not that same week. Uh, but we're in our two year two year period now for our Bible study, and so we have done a lot. What is it? April 21st. April 21st. Oh, oh okay. wait a minute. That says 2021. No, because so. it was April 27th. I thought it was 27th. No, this was... is, okay, this is 2021. So it's that's the wrong. Yeah, we did the year before. Yeah. We started in 2020. Right. So right. It's about two years, y'all. Mm. About two years. <laughs> and we have covered quite a bit of the Bible. Now, I know some of you all come out of um, traditions where you found books where you can read the whole Bible in a year. God bless you if that's something that you were able to do well. But we want to do more than just read the words uh, and to be able to say that we've actually gone cover to cover. Uh, what we try to do is to intentionally and attentionally pay attention to what thus saith the Lord. We believe that Holy Scripture matters, that the Bible has authority over our lives, that uh, that the word of God is good for our inspiration, for our correction, for our rebuke, for our guidance, for our ed education. And so we have uh, explored, we started with the, the book of Acts, uh, and we'll be reading some from the book of Acts today uh, first. Uh, and then we, because we were coming out of the Easter season and moving towards Pentecost. And so we were tracking ourselves in terms of that moment. Uh, but we've, we, we've gone through and we've read a number of books in the Bible. I, I don't think that I could just to roll them off of my tongue, but we, we did the book of Acts. We also did the Johannine literature, which included the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in Revelation. Uh, we have uh, done... Uh, uh, do we do was it was it uh daniel we did we did the book of daniel another apocalyptic text uh we have read books uh written by biblical scholars like uh reverend dr brian blunt who who um he is uh preparing to retire as the president of union presbyterian seminary barbara and so we are celebrating his magnificent career and his scholarship as as pastor as a scholar as a president of the seminary there in richmond virginia uh he is irreplaceable so i i don't i don't know where they go from from there um we, we've read uh some of his books and his commentary we read dr esau mccauley um so we've done quite a bit um reading while black is dr esau mccauley's book and um and now we are reading a book called we Make the Road by Walking by uh, Brian McLaren, who is a public theologian, which takes us on a year-long quest for spiritual reformation, reorientation, and, act and activation. It's a reactivation or activation. It's not a, uh, a book designed to cover all 66 books of the Bible, 39 in the Old, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, 27 in the New, but it is tracked to the traditional church calendar and so it moves us as we move within our church life through different seasons whether that be easter which we just celebrated or what i call resurrection what i call resurrection sunday as we move towards the pentecost uh, there are reflections and and readings of scriptures to kind of get us to to, to move along that that period um so this is sharon i'm so used to, this is the same wednesday in 2020 may 13th Really, is it today? It would be a year today. Oh wow! Yeah. All right. So one, two years, two years ago today, uh, we had our first Bible study, and so let me just say I, I give thanks for for those of you who are on Zoom, um, as well as those who watch on Facebook and YouTube, because 
Y'all have been faithful. Uh, it, it is a it is a small Bible study, uh, which is fine because it is a it, it is a um, very engaging in Bible study and it allows you to to ask questions, to give your opinion. There's no such thing as a bad question except the question that you do not ask. Um, there are some opinions that, that, that may not be rooted in scripture as much. And so if you offer an opinion or reflection, we encourage you to say, okay, well, um, do you find that in scripture or is that the, is that the gospel of Lucata? Um, because you know, the, the, the gospel of Luke is more valuable than the gospel of Lucata. <laughs> so, um, we, we, uh, we challenge one another in that way, but we seek to read what the Bible actually says. Uh, going uh, into the word, not simply by the word. Uh, we ask, uh, what does it say? Who's speaking? Uh, who are they speaking to? What it would have meant thousands of years ago when it was uh, first said or heard uh, in its original context. And then we go to what it means to us today. So uh, we will begin with a prayer over the, over, over the word. Um, and let me just say... Um, and maybe I'll ask a little later. I want to get some reflections from you all before we close, you know, just about these last two years. I mean, I, like I said, anniversaries are important to me. and I may not always keep on top of them like I need to, but I'm, I'm, it's a blessing that this happens to be that two-year anniversary. So I would love to hear some of your reflections. Let me say, if you are watching on Facebook or you're watching uh, on YouTube, you can put your questions and your comments uh, on the Facebook page. I will try to track uh, the the comments that may come in on social media uh, on my, no, I'll, I'll do on the Witherspoon Street uh, Facebook page, social media, and I'll put it up here so I can actually see if comments come in. Uh, I may not, I may jump over to the, it also goes over my personal Facebook page, Lukata and Jumbe. Uh, I'm not able to track YouTube at the same time. One of these days, I want to get to a point where I've figured it out technologically with these platforms. And maybe it's when you see those people that have three different monitors in front of them on their desk. It may be one of those situations where I can actually see all the different comments and feedback that come in. But do know that I appreciate them. And I do go back and I and I uh, read them. I, I oftentimes will just go back and, and watch the whole Bible study. Uh, I I have a tendency to be a very hard on myself in terms of I want to make sure I didn't say anything wrong uh, and and I didn't and I, if I need to come back the next week and correct it now I mean I assume that I can say things that are wrong I don't think that I know everything but I, I consider it a heavy responsibility that if I get something wrong I want to be able to go back and try to correct it uh, the next week and so. Please, I'm not afraid of questions or critiques, uh, and, and if you don't agree, that's fine. Uh, but if you can't defend your belief, then you might have some trouble with me. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for the blessing of this day. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for this Bible study. Two years in on this day, Lord God, continue to guide us and lead us and allow us to have this anniversary of a time a reflection of where we have been before we arrived at this point and where do we go from here, Lord God. It was your word and your spirit that inspired me that said, help your people who are called by my name, help your people who you have been res assigned responsibility to as the pastor of Witherspoon Street, help them to fall in love with the Bible, help them to take it seriously, Help them to not simply go by it, but go into it and allow them to be exposed to a truth that can transform not only their, their answers, but their questions that can transform the way that they see, the way that they hear, the way that they understand and the way that they walk. And we make the road by walking. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together and say together. Amen. Amen. All right, so the, the, the scriptures that we, we're, we're reading, we're in chapter 36. For those who have the book, you can find this book wherever it is you, you buy your books. Um, we did not start the beginning. Uh, we started where we were in the church calendar. And so we are now uh, where McLaren places us uh, at chapter 36. Let me just say this, because we read these books, 
Uh, it is not necessarily an endorsement or a say that we understand or agree with everything that is contained therein. We do look to, to scholars who have something interesting to say. We've read a lot of John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg. Um, we, we, I said Esau McCauley, uh, Brian Blunt, uh, McLaren. So we read all kinds of different people. We read younger and older. We read Protestants and Catholics. We read black people and white people. We read uh, women and men. We need to actually introduce uh, some more readings from um, women. And I think, you know, as we look forward that we're going to to get some more text. I've been reading this book here, which has really been interesting, Self, Culture, and Others in Womanist Practical Theology, um, which is written by Phyllis Isabella Shepherd. And uh, and so if you have text that you would like to, to have us read, that you would like to have us to consider uh, as a part of our study, we can do that. And let me say this, it's open. Um, I, I have been one, when I was in seminary, my mother may be surprised to, to hear this. You know, as much as I'm a Presbyterian and I believe in studying the, the great theologians like, you know, John Calvin and John Knox or Martin Luther or Karl Barth or, or whoever else, or my liberation uh, theologians like James Cone or Gustav Gutierrez. Uh, I, I have said, I really think in seminary, they need to teach uh, Joyce Meyer and T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen. Why? Because that's what more people are actually reading. That's what more people are actually listening to. More people are receiving whatever theological perspective that they have uh, and, the, and, the, and the way that they interpret scripture and the way they interpret their reality through the prism of having read a lot of what would be called televangelists or, or, or public theologians or, or, or those who, who, who show up on their television screens or on their computer monitors. And you, you teach that not necessarily for the purpose of, of trying to indoctrinate someone to believe the theology of, of a T.D. Jakes or of a Joel Osteen, but it's important that we know what they're teaching. It's important that we know what they're preaching because just because you make it sound good, and T.D. Jakes is a phenomenal preacher, or, or because you say it with a smile, like Joel Osteen, or, or, with, a, or with a Southern charm and wit, uh, like Joyce Meyer, uh, that in and of itself is not sufficient for understanding its theological weight or its value or its importance. And so, uh, you you can't even bring correction if you feel called to do that if you don't know what it says. So if there are folks who would like to for us to study a particular text that comes from um, some other sort of tradition, very different. Like I said, I would like for us to consider a woman. So maybe Joyce Meyer might be one. Maybe we'll eat some Juanita Bynum or you know there 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 are and and, and not to say that. Those are the only women theologians. I mean, there's some amazing women theologians like uh, Shepherd or like Renita Weems and and others that that, that we can uh, we we could just spend some time with Katie Cannon. Uh, there's a number of books and and I love her scholarship. But be 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 thinking about that today. We're reading McLaren, the Uprising on Worship, and McLaren has us begin with Psalm 103, Acts chapter two, verses 41. Uh, through 47, uh, he then has us go to a couple of the the letters of Paul, First uh, Corinthians, uh, chapter 14, verses 26 through 31, uh, and then we are we are led to um, his letter to the believers at Colossae, Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 through 17. So what I'm going to do is, and I use uh, Bible Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway gives us the opportunity to um, kind of quickly and smoothly move uh, into text and to see different versions of the text. Uh, whatever Bible that you have is fine, and please feel free to share whatever Bible you have. I'm going to Start with Psalm 103 with the New Revised Standard Version. And I'm, and I'm curious about this. I don't know, and, and maybe I'm just, I'm missing it. So now on Bible Gateway, it says New Revised Standard Version, Updated Edition. I didn't know there was an updated edition until I saw it on Bible Gateway. So certainly the, 
the Bible that I have is not the updated edition. I don't know to what extent it may differ from the New Revised Standard Version, but the, no longer is there just a listing for just the New Revised Standard Version the way that I remember having seen it on Bible Gateway. But we're going to start with the, the 103rd Psalm, which is a Psalm of David, a Psalm of Thanksgiving for God's goodness. And do we have a volunteer, someone who'd like to read? And I want you just to read the whole Psalm. It, it is a Psalm that has 22 verses, but we love to hear your voices as well. So is there someone who's willing to, to read Psalm 103? Any volunteers? I'll read it, Reverend. Thank you, Barbara. Thanksgiving for God's goodness of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin. I'm sorry, let me move it up. All right. <laughs> I gotta find it now. Okay. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over and it is gone and its place knows it no more but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Is that the last one? No, okay. Uh, well. 19. All right. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Reverend, when I read this this morning, mm -hmm. I when I read verses four through five and, mm -hmm. and and i'll read that again who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles i thought of sundiata mm. when i was reading that amen i talked to um mariama yesterday i was having breakfast and she told me that he had you know he'd been freed mm -hmm. and as i was reading this i thought about it verses four and five i thought about him mm -hmm redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles amen mm. amen well that, that 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 is indeed a blessing uh for sundiata who is a 85 year old um man who has been in prison for almost 50 years who the supreme court of new jersey just yesterday uh reversed a decision, a continuing decision of a parole board who for eight different times uh, denied his parole. They said that they had not applied the law and he was to be, he is, he is to be released and we're looking forward to that. And we have said from the beginning that we know that it is, we value the activists, we value the, the, 
the lawyers. We value all the work that has been done by the organizers and so many of us. But um, this reminds us that it is the Lord who redeems our lives from the pit and who grounds us with steadfast love and mercy and that satisfies us with good as long as we live and renews our youth like the eagles. And um, and so that's a good reflection and connection to to in real time, you know, what it could mean for us today. I, I'm assuming that some people are familiar with um, this first verse uh, in terms of having heard it sung before, right? Bless the Lord. Don't make me sing it. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that oh, is within me. Bless his you you interrupted my you interrupted my flow now. I was saying <laughs> my I think my my uh connection is messing up, so I'm uh, going in and out. Okay. <laughs> All right. You probably want to out. I'm just gonna mute right. everything and, and probably stop the video too. Not you cut my flow. Well, this is a familiar <laughs> hymn, right? This is something that we hear sung. This first verse of 103, bless the Lord on my soul. And you know, it's interesting, and Sharon, uh, this morning this morning in our Lectio Divina, as we were looking at, um, what was it, the Gospel of, was it First John chapter 1, verse 16? John, 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 1, John, John 1, 16. 16. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, and I was thinking about that when, when we were reading it this morning, that oftentimes in the Bible, there are words that are used in certain ways that are oftentimes different than the ways that we that we use them. In in John 1:16, uh, the word was um, grace, right? Because it said that, uh, and at least in the NRSV, from His fullness. And I know Bruce has a preference for the Amplified. I don't have that open right now, but from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace, right? And lots of times when we use the word grace, how do we use it? What is, what, what is, give, give me, a, give me a context in which a, a sentence, you use the word grace in a sentence. Let's bless the food and say grace. Right. I said now, yes. So and you just use both of the words now, the, the, the <laughs> bless and the grace. So yeah. lots of times when we talk about grace, we, we, we tend to think of it as, Thanksgiving. Let's say grace. Let's let 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 let's say let let let's give thanks. And oftentimes, when we hear bless, uh, blessing, we oftentimes see it as something that is a uh, uh, a gift, uh, an anointing, something that is given to us, a blessing. But but here. And and oftentimes, and this and this shows up, you know, in a number of different places, um, in the Psalms and in other scriptures. You'll you'll find it in the twenty eighth Psalm, the thirty first Psalm, the sixty sixth Psalm. That bless is a, is a word that's used as an expression of gratitude. You know, maybe like um, bless you, God bless you. Um, after somebody gives something to you, oh, bless you. So that's the way it's being used here, and. And when and when we we say bless the Lord, we're saying not that we are bestowing some sort of anointing or gift on God, but that we are giving an expression of thanksgiving for what God has done. Uh, and and it's interesting that that the psalmist here says um, the psalmist is talking to who. Let me just, let's, let's do our exegetical work. In this first verse, who does it seem as if the psalmist is talking to? Himself? Yeah. The psalmist is talking to his soul. The psalmist is, or, or, or she is speaking to what is within. Yes. You know, not not that that don't don't say thanksgiving with with my with my flesh, with my external that I'm talking to myself and I'm saying 
self, soul, say thank you. Give gratitude. Give gratitude, oh my soul, all that is within me. Give thanks for God's, for the Lord's holy name. Bless the verse, the second verse. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, still talking to myself. And do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity. You might say, uh, it, it, does this, does this uh, brother, this sister have, having some, some, um, some mental health issues? Because there, this is an internal conversation. The psalmist is talking to the psalmist. You know, forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Though we can take this as a, um, a word that we share to someone else and, and telling them, give thanks to God and give gratitude to the Lord for what the Lord has done. The psalmist here is, is speaking to the psalmist, speaking to the soul speaking to what is within. Why do you think that, that, that the psalmist might do that? And why might that be important? Just to remind himself of all the things that God has, has, that the Lord has done for him. Right. Absolutely. And let me say this, talking to yourself is important. You actually probably trust yourself more than you trust anybody else. So if you tell yourself something, you're likely to believe it. You want to say the right things. You don't want to lie to yourself, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes you, I, I can do it. I can, I, 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 you have to, you say, get yourself hyped up, get yourself psyched up. It's because the sound of your voice matters to yourself. And so sometimes we have to go and, and, and there's different kinds of strategies. Look in the mirror and tell yourself. I used to tell my children all this. I can't do math. I said, that's a lie. Go and tell yourself a hundred times you can do math. If you keep saying you can't do math, you're going to believe it. And you're not going to be able to do math. Because you keep saying that. How are you going to believe that you can do math if you keep telling yourself you can't do math? You believe yourself. So the words that we speak to ourselves actually matter. Yes, they can remind us to do things, but it also, it situates certain types of, of, of beliefs and acceptances of things that are, are, are true when we hear them spoken to ourselves even more so than someone else. In, in church, a preacher will often say, turn to your neighbor and tell him whatever. You can do it. But truly, if we wanted people to actually believe, and, and sometimes it's good to hear somebody else say it because you know you're not alone. Uh, he's, he, he, he's about to teach us something. But if you told yourself, she's about to teach us something. You'd be more likely to believe it. So maybe some of our preaching needs to shift and say, don't turn to your neighbor, turn to your soul. Turn to your soul and say this, that, and the other, because it will stick better when you speak it to yourself. And so the psalmist then goes to about, again, is giving this information to the soul, to the self, internalizing, digesting, receiving, works for vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. Let's, let's, remind, let's remind ourselves, Barbara, how the Lord works, what the, what the Lord does, has made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel, merciful and gracious, slow to anger. All of these characteristics will not accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever, does not deal with us according to our sins, doesn't treat us fairly, because it doesn't repay us for according to our iniquities. For as high as heavens are high above, so great is his steadfast love for those who fear him. 
east to west, has compassion for children, knows how we were made, remembers we are dust. Why do you think that's important? Why is it important that, that God would remember that we are dust? And let me say, I think it's a trick well, question. That one day we're going to return to dust. <laughs> and that he made us. That's right. what he made us from. Right. Any other thoughts about why you think it might be important that the psalmist would say, for the Lord knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. I gave you a little clue in terms of how I said it. Let me change the tone in terms of the same words. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. You see a difference? It's God remembers, God knows, even if we don't remember. God remembers, God knows that God created us, that God made us out of, out, of, out of dust, out of dirt, out of nothing, that God breathed the breath of life into our nostrils. And then that's, that's to humble us. So we're not thinking that we're so, because we, we don't remember that all of this was just dust out of nothing. And then he goes on to talk about that. Uh, mortals' days are like grass flowers in a field that the wind passes over and is gone, that we're temporary, but God is permanent. Steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, those who keep his covenant, remember to do his commandments. Bless the Lord. Soul, bless the Lord. And then who does he shift it to? O oh, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, Obedient to his spoken word. I just want to, I want to do a, uh, a uh, pop quiz. Everybody remember, we, we studied angels too in this Bible study in the last two years. What is an angel? In the English sense of the word? A, mess, a messenger from there God. There you go. Good, Barbara. It's a, it's a messenger. So don't, don't be thinking about flowing gowns and, and flapping wings and halos whenever you hear angels mentioned in, the, in, in, in Scripture. So, bless the Lord, O oh, you his angels. Now it's you messengers, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. And then it goes out to all of his hosts, and that would be the heavenly host. Bless the Lord, all the heavenly hosts. So it begins to transition from, from us, from my soul, from messengers to the heavenly host of God, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord. And then so the, the, the shifting of who the psalmist is talking to changes at the end. When you get to 20, 21, and 22, in the last part of 22, he turns it back. But it expands that this is not just a word of, that needs to be known and remembered and gratitude expressions from my soul, but the messengers, the angels, the angelic heavenly host, all of his ministers who do God's will, all of creation. That's verse 22. Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Okay, so that's the first reading that we have. In, in verse 17, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and where is the other word? He uses the word fear. He uses fear and, and mm -hmm. those who fear him, and then he uses it before that. Before that, you said? Yeah, he yeah, uses the word fear again. Uh -huh. So I thought about fear. Fear. <clears throat> How do we fear? We, just, we have different kinds of fear. You know, is, is that word really that we're afraid? Is it talking about fear, that kind of fear? Or 
Right? Yeah, no, I don't think it is. I, I I think that when we when we hear and fear is used a lot in the um in the uh in the Bible and sometimes I mean it can be useful and, and some of our popular uh evangel uh evangelical preachers or televangelists might say, well fear just means F E A R false evidence appearing real. There's acronyms and things that people come up with to talk about it. But when in the Bible fear is is referenced, it, it has a couple of different meanings. Um, English has some limitations, and we oftentimes have one word, like we've talked about love before, uh, in terms of how if we don't see the original Greek or whatever, we can miss some nuances. But fear in this context, Bruce, in the Hebrew, would speak to reverence, would speak to respect. It's it's the way that you would, and I think I remember in the movie Malcolm X and Denzel was saying that he pulled it from uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. He said that you fear something as if you would fear looking into the sun. Not because it's scary, not because it's frightening, not because it's like a a vampire or a werewolf or something that makes you shake, but you respect its power so much that you don't look at it directly because you know that it would damage your eyes. You know that you cannot take it. So you receive the blessing respectfully, but you don't look at it directly. You receive the sunlight that illuminates other things for you, but you're not going to be so bold as to try to stare into it eye to eye because you respect its power, its authority. And so here, um, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who, and, 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 and I, I, you know what, why don't we do this? Since, since you, since you have become a recent lover of the, uh, of the amplified version yep. of the Bible, Let's see. Let, let let's see. Let's see how the uh, the Amplified Bible perhaps clarifies that uh, particular passage of scripture. Let's see what it does. What was that? Seventeen. Mm-hmm. So, well, and it's also in 13, I see, but I'll, I'll, I'll look this yeah, up. So let's look at 13 because it gives it here. So it can also show up there. But in 13, when it deals with fear, as a father who loves and pities his children, so the Lord loves and pities those who fear him with reverence, worship, and awe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and so, and, and here it says those who reverently and worshipfully fear him. Okay. So it gives that kind of clarification of what it means when uh, it's it's talking about fear. Now there there are times in Scripture where, uh, for example, angels frequently and messengers and even Jesus comes and speaks to people and says, uh, "Fear not," uh, and it's not and they're not saying don't be respectful. They're not saying don't uh, uh, don't be reverent, don't be worshipful. Because there is a kind of fear that also paralyzes, um, and it's and it tends to be things when people don't understand it, and don't uh, don't realize what it is, and so they cower, not not understanding, and that fear gets in the way of blocking a blessing. But in this context, in the psalm, it's about being reverent, respectful, worshipful. So, for uh, those, Lot, Lot's wife didn't fear. It's the warning and advice that, he, that she was given. And she, and in that story, yeah, she turned and looked back, right? Uh, and, 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 and stood at it and stared at it directly and looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, and paid a price for that. You know, at, at some point I want us to, we, we need to read that. We, 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 need, we, we need to read it because that's a, that's a very interesting story that I think that we oftentimes miss. Um, and you know we we uh we put a lot on Lot's wife and then don't remember what Lot did after that, uh, mm -hmm. because his 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 sin was pretty significant. 
uh, as well. Uh, after he didn't look back, but he, he he did some other things once they got into that cave, uh, and so it, it's something that we that, that we might want to to explore. Let let let's go to Acts to, to to the book of Acts because I want to, and I see um, Kim Kim thanks. She said that, that the angels are a messenger, um, and we have a couple of people who are joining us on Facebook. Good to see you all on here with us. So let's let's go to Acts two verses 41 through 47 and i'll read this one uh, and then i'll have someone else read first corinthians and colossians so chapter two so those who welcomed his message were baptized and that day about three thousand persons were added so this is uh peter uh who is uh th this is on the this is on what we what we call today in the uh in the christian church the the day of of Pentecost and people have at this point spoken in tongues uh, there there's a translation of the speaking in tongues and then Peter gives an explanation in terms of what was happening he said no you know they're not uh, they're not they're not drunk on wine it's still it's still early in the morning which for me always suggested that if it was late at night you know who knows what it, what, what it was how it would have been interpreted but uh, but so after he gives this message, uh, and this is uh, in in verse forty, verse forty one, we we begin to hear about those who become the first, what they call converts, uh, to the church, and 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 become a part of this church, this ecclesia, which we're going to hear about in McLaren's uh, later reflection. So those who welcome Peter's message were baptized, and that day about three thousand persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God, having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number of those who were being saved. All right, so this is a, um, a view into that first century church, uh, what is called in, the, in, in both Greek and Latin, the ecclesia, uh, which we learned about when we did. I remember I asked you also, what's, so what's a church? What is a church? And some folks had struggle in terms of giving a, what they, once they articulated it, what they considered to be an adequate definition. But tell me what you think about this passage, Acts 2, 41 through 47, describing the growth of the church in terms of numbers, but then also describing the, the, the activities and the function and the growth of the church spiritually in terms of what's happening. Both of those things are referenced in between verses 41 through 47. You have any thoughts about that? Come on, we talk about this all the time. We got to grow the church. How'd they grow the church? Well, by, by, by uh, the preaching, but also, well, I would say the teaching rather. Mm -hmm. And then they fellowship and they broke bread and they prayed and we do the same. I thought about that when we read it, you know, mm -hmm. we, we do that also. Yeah. So they had 3000 people who joined on one day. Isn't that something? One day. And they devoted themselves, referring to those who were added to the apostles teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So those things are all, all important, right? Teaching, fellowship, the sacrament of breaking of bread. And we, we're gonna learn more about what that, what that was. The breaking of bread wasn't just that little wafer and the juice that we do on first Sundays and the prayers. Okay, all of that was a part of the devotion this was what might be considered to be a criteria for being a member in right standing. Mm. 
So we have that here in this first century church. And what was the life like? Once you were a member in right standing, what, what was it like to be a part of this first century church? I think, I think the message here is about uh, uh, collective unity, that no one is, that they're, that whatever they possess belong to everybody. Mm. That this is mine, and you can't have it. But it was a uh, uh, knowledge that whatever you owned belonged to everyone, and it was for the benefit of everyone. And uh, we have lost that. Yeah, isn't that incredible? Could you imagine if there was a church? And what everyone understood about the church was if they have it, I have it. Mm -hmm. And if I have it, they have it. Like there's never going to be a time when somebody can't pay their bills if there's somebody else that is able to help them to pay their bills. This is not going to happen. You're not going to be without food. You're not going to be without transportation. You're not going to be without the things that you need. In fact, we're going to hold all these things together in common. If I got it, you got it. If you got it, I got it. I am because we are. We are because I am. What if there was a church? You know what? That's why 3,000 people join on one day. Right. Except Thank for that one rich guy that Jesus asked, when he, when he asked Jesus, what, what do you have to do to to get into heaven and he could he couldn't pass the test yeah give up all your possessions and follow me and his face just fell and cracked on the ground he said, oh i can't do that now I, i've done all these other things i've been obedient to my parents i haven't broken these commandments i'm so not like, giving up my 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 tails like no <laughs> yeah but i mean they that they that they Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. I mean, this, this was what you were becoming a part of when you were becoming a part of the ecclesia, when you were becoming a part of the church, when you were becoming a part of the people of the way. That there would be, you know, that, that there would be no, no, millionaires who were living well and living fat and 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 people who were broke and homeless that were all a part of the same community that everybody took care of each other and i mean and and think about it on a level of what you for those who have raised children isn't that what your children enjoyed when you raise them up in your in your home, if you had it, they were gonna have it. You wasn't gonna be sitting there eating a piece of chicken and they're sitting there looking at you hungry. That wasn't gonna happen. In fact, you 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 might you might give them the big piece of chicken, mm -hmm. and and you took less because you considered yourself connected and responsible to and for one another. And imagine if we had a church that actually functioned that way. The, when I'm preaching this, this Sunday, the title is simply, What If? And I'm exploring a different range of what if sort of possibilities and scenarios. And, 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 and what if we were actually a church like what, what What if you could find churches like this all around the country? There would never be this thing about, well, Oh, who, who's the who's the fastest growing religion or and all there wouldn't be no one who could keep up that that it, it, it wouldn't matter what it is that they taught and on some level if this happened and this was a part of what 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 occurred when you became a part of it and okay. and be clear this is why people join gangs i know a lot of gang members i've done a lot of gang funerals the reason why people join gangs is because there is an ethos that says, if I got a crip, you got it, blood. That if, if, if you have it, 
then I have it because we take care of each other. If I eat, you're going to eat. And being a part of and being connected and being included and being cared for and taken care of, even if you're all functioning at a lesser level than you might function by yourself for a moment, to know that you have that security and that protection and that support is compelling. And it's something that people seek after and search for and, 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 and desire in very real ways. Um, let, let, let's move down to 1 Corinthians, to the Apostle Paul's uh, letter to the believers at Corinth that he talks about orderly worship. Can someone volunteer to read? Verses 26 through 30, 31 for us. I'll read it. Go ahead, Bruce. Thank okay, you. Go ahead, Bruce. So orderly worship. What should be done then, my brothers and sisters? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a, rev a rev revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speaks in tongue, let there be only two, or at least, or mo at most three, and each in turn, let one interpret. If there is no one to interpret, then let them be silent in church and speak to themselves and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what, what is said. If someone sitting receives a re revelation, let the first person be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. Thank you, Bruce. Now, I'm curious to hear you all's thoughts about this. This can be a somewhat of a contentious scripture, scriptural view for those who come out of traditions where you have uh, the, the glossolalia or the speaking of tongues. This can be a scripture that people may think contradicts what happened on Pentecost Sunday, you know, in terms of the, the, the movement of the Holy Spirit and all of these different speak, people were speaking different languages and different tongues. It certainly just wasn't uh, uh, two or three at most, and they weren't doing it in turn. It, 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 the, 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 the description that we find earlier in the, in the, in the book of Acts in chapter two uh, describes what seems to be a different scene. So I'm just wondering, and I know that you may or may not come from traditions or speaking of tongues. Now, also, I guess I'll invite, you know, those who are also watching on, on Facebook, if you, if you have some things that you might share. Um, how do you read this, this, this passage of Scripture? And what do you think about Paul's instructions to the believers at Corinth uh, about um, the responsibilities of orderly worship? Reverend, I was uh, concerned about the part of speaking in tongues because in our church, we don't say anything about, about speaking in tongues, but I have been to, ch to churches where, you know, they talk about speaking in tongues and what it means and, and it says too, someone has to interpret it, but I've never heard anyone speak in tongues. So I was gonna ask you to kind of talk about that a little. <laughs> Okay, we'll be happy to. Are there others that have thoughts? I'd say that uh, <clears throat> in those churches where people are going to speak in, in tongues, how, how do you know who's going to speak in tongues? And, and then how do you know um, whoever has the, 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 uh, the talent to interpret what was said? How do you know who they are? Mm -hmm. So... And so also, um, We're in, we're in, Paul is talking about Corinth. So Corinth was, was the wild, wild west at that time. Kim, can you give, can you give us some uh, perspective on this? The, the I was just going to share that I grew up in a church where people did speak in tongues. So I'm very familiar with that. And the tradition was, well, the in, in part of the worship 
everybody was free to worship God in whatever language came to them. So you can have people in, in worship speaking in tongues. However, someone might speak louder than everyone else and it's and be, and because of the volume of because of the volume and the intensity it was a signal that this was a message from god mm. and so everyone would quiet down and that person um, would continue to speak in tongues and then there was a then it, then it was quiet it was absolutely quiet and even now in the church that I go to now is quiet until the interpretation comes. And the belief is that the interpretation will come. And if it doesn't, <clears throat> then I've seen, I've seen the pastor um, address it, address that and, and use the scripture to say that there should be an interpretation that comes forth. So that's that's how I grew grew up, and that's what I am uh, mm. comfortable with. Honestly, I never thought about the the situation in Acts, where there was no interpretation. It's just everyone speaking in in their own language. Well, not in their own language, but in another another language. But there, but there were people there who understood what was being said. There's no one. The Bible doesn't tell, scripture doesn't tell us what was being said. But well, there people there that understood because they said, oh, you know, someone's so speaking in my language. Mm -hmm. Understanding. And they were speaking in, in their own language about God's acts of power, right? Uh, right. God's deeds. It's, uh, let, me, let me find it. So chapter 2, verse 11 says, and this after it gives a long list of different people who were there. Cretans and Arabs, in our mm. own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. Uh, and so it is interesting and it's different because, one, it's not an unknown language, right? right? Like oftentimes when we talk about speaking in tongues, it's a language that it's Arabic for for some people. It's it's the language of the Cretans for another. It's 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 the language of the Parthians or the Medes. And so mm -hmm. there's and there and there is an interpreter. There's someone, mm -hmm. but their but their interpretation doesn't seem to be for the group. Group, right, right. It's it's for themselves that they that they actually hear it. So it it, it does it does seem a little different, mm -hmm. right? Than than what Paul is describing. And and Paul go, is, in several places talks about the speaking of tongues and the gift and describes it as a gift. Um, in some traditions, it, it's, a, it's taught that if you don't have the, this is the manifestation of the spirit. This is what shows that you have been baptized in the spirit. Right. And if you do not speak in tongues, if you are unable to speak in tongues, then that may speak to where you are or where you are not in terms of your spiritual development or growth or, and even in your final destiny. Uh, I want to hear a little more. I wanna, I'll, I'll say I'll say a few more things about it. Not necessarily thinking that I have all of the answers to this or even all the questions, but I want to just hear if there are others that might have had experiences or can can share some reflections on um, on what Paul is talking about. And I and Bruce, I do think you hit on something when you say he's speaking to to Corinth uh, mm -hmm. that we should consider as well. Other thoughts? Okay, well, and I'm, I'm checking Facebook. Uh, don't see anything there. Uh, I, I, I grew up in a church, Kim, also, where there was speaking in tongues. Um, Sherman Street, Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. Um, and there would be times and there would be moments in the midst of, of preaching or in the midst of prayer or in the midst of songs where someone would be, as they said, they were touched by the Spirit and they would begin to speak in tongues. 
Uh, it wasn't something that I saw later. Uh, and in the church where I actually received my call to ministry, which was a Pentecostal church, Daystar International Fellowship in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where everyone, which it sounds similar to, to what you're describing, Kim, where there would be moments where everyone, they were given the space and even the directions, now let us speak in tongues, and then everyone would start speaking in tongues, and then there would be some, someone that there would be an identified intensity, uh, and then there would be an interpretation. Um, and there, there would be, you know, in, in Anderson, Indiana, it was more of kind of like being slain in the spirit, and people would fall out, uh, and they would speak, and they would, you know, uh, be out of control in terms of their own body. People would try to hold them down or keep them from hurting themselves or hurting other people. They may lay on the ground. Uh, they may have a cover with the purple sheet. I mean, I, I have I have been through many different traditions. Um, and even, Barbara, the, the Presbyterian Church that I pastored uh, in Irvington, yeah. uh, First Presbyterian Church of Irvington, there was a speaking, in, a speaking of tongues. Uh, when I was in Africa, and I and I pastored uh, and sort of as a uh, a supporter of a pastor in um, Akrapong, Ghana, um, people spoke in tongues. It, it it was something that was a part of the, the the spiritual gifting of the house of the church. And I think that when we look at what Scripture says. The thing that we should pay attention, I think, with what Paul is doing here and in and, and, uh, speaking to the church at Corinth is he is trying to make sure that this manifestation, the spiritual manifestation of the speaking of tongues is something that is received in the ways that it's supposed to be received. Uh, that one, there is an order. There is a responsibility that different people have and all people don't do the same things. He says, some come with a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And that everything that should be done is for building up the body, not for bringing attention or focus on the individual. You know, one of the things that I like about some Presbyterian churches, you may notice at Nassau Presbyterian Church, the choir is behind the congregation. Have you? Has anybody ever worshipped at, at churches where the choir is back behind you and not in front of you? I've been in Nassau, but it was so long ago. I don't. Re I don't remember. Really. Yeah, the, the the choir sings from the back, up in the balcony, mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that. Theologically, one could argue. Yes. I'm sorry. Say that, Kim. I was. I was saying yes. I have seen that actually. Yes. Right. So theologically, a, a reason for that is because you don't want to focus the attention on the choir, on the singers, on the soloists. In fact, what you should be focusing on is the, the, the Bible, the Word of God, like you know, it's a witherspoon. We have the Bible, we have the font, and you have the preaching. That's where your focus should be. If you're looking at the, the choir and the singing, it's, oh, girl, she can sing. Oh, he, he tore down that hymn. I mean, you're, 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 you're building up an individual rather than receiving the blessing that comes from the expression. And so Paul gets specific with the tongues in 27, where he says, because he doesn't want there to be a competition. You may have been in some churches where they just, you know, Kim, you said whoever speaks the loudest. Can you imagine that if, if, they, if they start doing a battling, I'm going to get louder than you. I got a bigger voice than you. I, I got bass, you know, in my right. tongue. Right, I mean, right. and, so, and so Paul is like, look, we need to make sure that the blessing of the speaking of tongues are actually received. Because if you're just speaking in an unknown language and there's no one to interpret it and say what it actually means, then he says this in another scripture, you're just babbling. And it doesn't, mean, doesn't do anything for the body of Christ. So he's, he's putting things in order. He wants there not to be competition. He wants to make sure that there is someone to interpret, in fact, if there isn't someone to interpret, just speak to your tongues to yourself. Be silent in church and speak to themselves and to God. Let your tongues be for your own edification, for your own lifting up. You interpret it for yourself. 
If someone sitting receives a revelation, let the first person be silent so they can testify and say what it is. And so Paul, I think, and Bruce Corinth was a, I think you said Wild Wild West. They had a lot of issues in terms of being out of control. And I think that we also have to consider whenever we read scripture, and particularly this kind of scripture, Paul is speaking to the believers at Corinth. What did he say? Who's speaking? Who is he speaking to? So we know what he says. We know it's Paul. He's giving his view, his opinion, his perspective, but he's speaking to a particular group that has some particular issues. It's the same church where he said the women shouldn't talk. You know, we, we, we pull that out and we in, in some traditions, oh, well, women shouldn't be ordained to preach at all because the Bible says that women are supposed to be silent in church. Paul was speaking to a particular church at a particular time in a particular place that has some particular problems mm -hmm. and recognize that these letters that were going were designed. Imagine if somebody sent a letter to Witherspoon. And they wanted to send a letter about instructions, you know, and th there may be a specific letter that talked about how you're supposed to comport yourself in congregational meetings. There might be a specific letter that might speak to how you how, how you should relate to a community that doesn't speak the same language as you. And, and give some specific directives. If you took that letter and just tried to apply it without contextualizing it to every other place, then you might miss the full meaning of the message. And I think that's some of what's happening here. Nicole, I see you come on now. Did you have something you wanted to share on, on, on this before we go to Colossians? Actually, it's not Nicole, it's mommy. She oh, had to okay. give me her phone because we were having problems with the Wi-Fi messing up the Zoom. Ah, okay, all right. Did you have something that you wanna share? Because I know you, you were in a church if I was in a church as a child that spoke in tongues, it's because you put me there. <laughs> That's right. And I, and I still speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do believe uh, that it is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that the anointing comes to some and not to others. But I also believe that the Holy Spirit gives us gifts as he sees fit or as, as the Holy Spirit sees fit, not he take that he away. Um, as the Holy Spirit sees, sees fit. And I don't think that it says that we're saved or not saved or any of that. I think that's just what folks put on stuff to try to put people into little spaces or boxes and things. But I know when the power of the Holy Spirit comes and I am praying and I begin to pray in another tongue and I can understand what I am saying and I know what's going on. And it's not for it might not be for the edification of the church because most of the time my praying in tongues is when I am praying alone. But there are times, even on morning prayer, when the Holy Spirit does come and then I welcome the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues. It, has, it doesn't have anything to do with being a show or anything like that. Uh, if others do, and it's not for my edification, then there will not be anyone to speak to it. But most often as that happens, someone on morning prayer will get, do an interpretation, although they might not even be aware of it. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, that first verse here, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. So Paul, and he also talks to this about the church at Corinth. We're one body with many different body parts. You know, the ear doesn't tell the nose what to do or how to do it. They have different functions. They have different purposes. You know, uh, the eyes don't have the same function as the feet. And everyone doesn't have the same gifts. Right. And, but, 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 I, but I think that we should, we, 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 we should never disconnect ourselves from any particular spiritual gifts because traditionally we haven't seen it before mm -hmm. we haven't done it before i'll say you know i i i i have never to my understanding spoken in tongues before 
And there was a there was a time and a season when I was a part of a church that really emphasized that, that actually did say that you need to be able to speak to tongues as evidence of, of, of a spiritual anointing, that I was a little concerned uh, about, you know, whether or not I was going to be given the gift. And then I started watching closely, and I've seen people who 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 seem to be subject to peer pressure. Mm-hmm. And they're saying super califragilistics, expialidocious, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. That's Mary mm-hmm. Poppins. Mm-hmm. I know, I know that, I know that language, you know. So, you know, and so it's it's it, it's something I think that 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 churches and individuals need to spend some time with, and don't fear and don't quench the spirit. It may be that you were supposed to speak tongues at some point, and because you were fearful of it fearful, right. and you hadn't seen it before. Mm-hmm. That you kept your mouth and your teeth clenched, your mouth closed and your teeth clenched, and so that is something that we also want to be mindful of. But but Paul, I think, is doing something for the church at Corinth that we want to pay attention to. That we'll look at in this reflection. We have one more passage, and then we're going to read this reflection, and then we close. Um, somebody can someone read Colossians chapter three verses twelve through seventeen for us. I'll read Lucata. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mama. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 Thank you, Molly. That should be your, your prayer for your meeting Monday night, Reverend. Oh, is that right? Yes. yes. Maybe every every time. <laughs> yeah. Our meetings that we have. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe 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 uh you know we we uh read that as our devotional as our devotional reading for, for, for Monday. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Absolutely. Uh and and I and I think what we what we must know is that Paul is 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 being mindful again of of what is supposed to be the character and the personality of the church. What is supposed to be the order of the church, what should be characteristic of the church, um, and 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 I don't see in here um, argument and debate and conflict and never-ending painful meetings or 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 um, secret meetings or whatever else that 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 there is a. What's supposed to be the activity and the life and what life looks like in, 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 in the ecclesia is a certain way. And as Kim said, you know, when talking about what happened in Acts, you know, have we gotten away from it? Have we gotten away from, from in everything that we do, we're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, that, that, at the way that we we teach and admonish is in, in wisdom, that we, we come with gratitude, that we know that we have to forgive as we have been forgiven, um, that we should be bound together in perfect harmony. 
I mean, that's that's what church is supposed to look like. So uh, I want to go to this reflection because I see we're running out of time here. Uh, McLaren um, in chapter thirty six, we are we are led to look at worship, and he, he goes back to this idea of the the uprising, the uprising of worship. And uh, I'm going to, so we can move relatively quickly. I'll start, but if somebody wants to take over, just jump in and do like my mama did when I was singing earlier, just interrupt, <laughs> take it. So uh, this, th this is from uh, chapter 36, again, for those who are maybe watching on, uh, on Facebook or YouTube and you don't have the book, this is, Brian McLaren's book, We Make the Road by Walking, and this is chapter 36, which gives us a reflection on these scriptures that we've read today. And I'd like to, if we could, I, I won't pause. Um, I'll certainly pass it on to somebody else once to start reading, and then we'll read all of it all the way through, and then we'll give our, our, our reflections. Um, he asked for us to imagine ourselves among the early disciples in Jerusalem, a year or so after Christ's death and resurrection. Many months have passed since the uprising began. For a short time, there were frequent reports of people seeing the risen Christ in a variety of locations. Soon, though, those reports became less frequent until they ceased entirely, and a story spread that Jesus had ascended to heaven and was now sitting at God's right hand, and that fueled a lot of speculation and debate about what we should expect. Some think God is going to stage a dramatic intervention any day. Some have even stopped working in anticipation of a massive change. But many of us have interpreted Jesus' ascension and enthronement to mean it is now time to get to work. Living in the light of what Jesus has already taught us, we're convinced that what matters now is not for Christ to appear to us, but for Christ to appear in us, among us, and through us. He wants us to be in, be his hands, be his feet, his face, his smile, his voice, his embodiment on earth. We gather frequently as little communities that we call ecclesia. We borrowed this term from the Roman Empire just as we, quote, borrowed the, the cross and reversed its meaning. For the Romans, an ecclesia is an exclusive gathering that brings local citizens together to discuss the affairs of the empire. Our ecclesia brings common people together around the affairs of the kingdom of God. Mm. Whenever and wherever the Roman ecclesia gather, they honor and worship the emperor and the pantheon of gods that support him. Whenever and wherever we gather, we honor and worship the living God revealed to us in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our ecclesia gather for worship wherever we can in homes, public buildings, or outdoor settings, and we gather whenever we can, but mostly at night since that's when nearly everyone, even the slaves among us, can assemble. We often gather on Sunday, the day Jesus rose and this uprising began, but none of us would argue about which day is best, since every day is a good day to worship God. Amen. For us, worship includes four main functions. We begin with the teaching of the original disciples, whom we now call apostles. Just as an apprentice carpenter is called a master carpenter, once he has learned the trade, the well-trained disciples who are sent out to teach each other are called apostles. The apostles tell us the story of Jesus, things they saw and heard as eyewitnesses of his time among us. They read the law and the prophets and explain how our sacred text prepared the way for Jesus and his good news. The apostles and their assistants also write letters that are shared from one ecclesia to the next. Our leaders read these letters aloud to us since many of us can't read ourselves. And whether in person or by letter, through the teaching of the apostles, we learn the words of Jesus, the stories about Jesus, the parables he told, the character he embodied, so we can walk the road he walked. Thank you. Our worship includes breaking the bread and mm -hmm. the wine as Jesus taught us. Usually this is a part of a meal that we call our first love feast or the Lord's table. It's so unlike anything any of us have ever experienced. Everywhere in our society, we experience constant divisions between the rich and the poor, slave and free, male and female, Jew and Greek, city born and country born and so on. 
But at the Lord's table, just as it was when Jesus, Jesus shared a table with sinners and outcasts, as we are all one, all love, all welcome as equals. We even greet each other with a holy kiss. Nobody would ever see a highborn person greeting a slave as an equal, except at our gatherings, where there are those social division, where those social divisions are being forgotten, and where we learn new ways of honoring one another as members of one family. Our mm -hmm. love. We say the words Jesus said about the bread being his body given for us and the wine being his blood shed for us and for our sins. Those words for us and for our sins are full of meaning, full of meaning for us. Just as we take medicine for an illness, we understand that Jesus' death is curing us of our whole old habits and ways. For example, when we ponder how he forgave those who crucified him, we are cured of our desire for revenge. When we see how he trusted God and didn't fear human threats, we are cured of our fear. When we remember how he never stopped loving, even to the point of death, we are cured of our hatred and anger. Mm -hmm. When we imagine his outstretched arms embracing the whole world, we feel our hearts opening and the love for the world, for the whole world too, curing us of our prejudice and favoritism, our grudges and selfishness. Lord Jesus. Along with the apostles teaching and the holy meal, our worship gatherings include fellowship or sharing. We share our experiences, our sense of what God wants to tell us, our insights from the scripture. We also share our fears, our tears, and our failures, and our joys. There is a financial aspect to our sharing as well. At each gathering, we take an offering and to distribute to those who are, the mo who are most in need among us and around us, especially the, the widows and the orphans. None of us are rich, but through our sharing, none of us are in need either. Amen. Somebody want to take up this last point? Finally, finally, along with the gathering for teaching, the Holy Meal and fellowship, our worship gatherings are, are for prayer. Finally, along with the gatherings for teaching, the Holy Meal and fellowship, our worship gatherings are for prayer. Some of our prayers are requests. We have learned that it's far better to share our worries with God than to be filled with anxiety about the things that or out of our control anyway. Right. We constantly pray for boldness and wisdom so that we can spread the good news of God's love to everyone, everywhere. We bring the needs and the sorrows of others to God, too, joining our compassion with God's great compassion. We pray for everyone in authority, that they will turn from injustice, violence, and corruption to ways of justice, peace, and fairness. We pray especially for those who consider themselves our enemies. The more they curse us and mistreat us, the more we pray for God's blessing on them, as Jesus taught us to do. Amen. Some of our prayers are confessions. We freely confess our sins to God because Jesus taught us that God is gracious and forgiving. God's grace frees us from hiding our wrongs or making excuses for them. We don't want to pretend to be better than we really are. And so prayers of confession help us be honest with God, ourselves and one another. All of our prayers lead us to thanksgiving and praise. We feel such joy to have God's spirit rising up in our lives that we can't be silent. We sing our deep joy and longing, sometimes through the ancient Psalms and also through spiritual songs that spring up in our hearts. The more we praise God, the less we fear or are intimidated by the powers of this world. And so we praise and worship God boldly, joyfully, reverently, and freely, and we aren't quite shy about it. When we gather, the Holy Spirit gives each of us different gifts to be used for the common good. Someone may be gifted to teach or lead. Someone may be moved to write and sing a song. Someone may be given an inspired word of comfort or encouragement or warning for our ecclesia. Some may be given a special message of knowledge and insight or teaching. Someone may speak in an unknown language. And some may pray with great faith for a healing or miracle to occur. The same spirit 
who gives the gifts is teaching us to be guided by love in all we say and do for love matters most for us. It's even greater than faith and hope. Mm. We don't want to give anyone the impression that everything is perfect with us. We have lots of problems and lots to learn, <laughs> but somehow our problems seem small in comparison to the joy that we feel. This is why even when we are tired from long days of work, even when we are threatened with persecution, even when life is full of hardships and we feel discouraged or afraid, we still gather to rise up in worship. In the face of Christ, we have come to see the glory of God, the love of God, the wisdom of God, the goodness of God, the power of God, the kindness of God, the fullness of God. Yes. In light of that vision of God in Christ, how can we not worship? Yeah. Hallelujah. How can we Woo. not worship? I love Amen. This Amen. 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 I love how this can we not worship in light of the fullness? We talked mm. about the fullness this morning, didn't we? Yes, we did. You can't, yeah. can't take away our joy. In mm. light of that vision of God in Christ, how can we not worship? Abundance of joy. You know, 3,000 were added in one day. Reverend, I like the part that says they borrowed from the Romans the cross and reversed its meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for an example, um, I believe it was um, not worshiping music, but um, what's the other group I belong to? <laughs> Church life? Presbyterian, Presbyterian women. Presbyterian women. Um, Shirley gave all the women for, for, for the, um, I think for the, for the, the tea that they had, Palm Sunday tea, I wasn't there, but she gave everybody a cross. Mm -hmm. she had, you know, she had ordered a cross for us. And, you know, the cross doesn't have the meaning for us that it had for the Romans. You know, it, 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 it lets us know that Christ was obeying the Father when he when he got on that cross, but he died for us to save us from our sins. Right. So that sentence really stuck stuck out, stuck home with me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. That cross became life instead of death. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. And even the ecclesia, they said they, they they took what the Romans did when they yeah. gathered together. And they changed it and made it something completely different and mm -hmm. filled it with all kinds of different characteristics. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess as we close to think about, and this is, this is about the uprising of worship. Should we ever have to be in a position where we are having to demand or urge those who are already members of the body of Christ to participate in worship. Is there something fundamentally wrong, whether it be with our worship or with the, the people, or maybe some, some a little bit of both, but if worship is as is described here in this first century ecclesia, as it said at the end, you know, we, how can we not worship? Do you feel okay if you miss church? If you miss being in worship on Sunday, is your week still okay? Uh, it, it, it's it's kind of like if you're used to eating every day, don't you feel a little bit different if you miss a meal or if you miss a whole day of eating? You notice it. You're like, wait a minute. I forgot to eat today. You might be at the end of the day. I didn't have breakfast or lunch. And you're starving by the time you get to dinner because you have a physical reaction. You know, if you if you're used to going to the gym every week or, you know, and you don't go to the gym for a couple of weeks, you feel it. If you if you're used to someone, you know, saying I love you or giving you a hug or giving you a kiss and then you 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 were, you were separated from that, whether it be because of COVID or, or whatever else, it, it, it shows up and, note, and you notice it because it's something that was valuable and that was important to you and had very real qualities. So if people can just not come to worship, 
and skip it. Maybe they come once a month out of obligation. Maybe they come once a quarter because they need to be, you know, show their face in the place. We should be compelled in the light of the vision of God in Christ. This is where we want to be. This is where we need to be. Some of you all know how it feels with morning prayer. Mm -hmm. Like if you go without morning prayer for maybe one day, you go out for a week, mm -hmm. something, something is not right. My morning is off. Yeah. You know, my, 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 my day is not quite the way it needs to be. And so we, I think we need to think about our worship. And churches all need to be thinking about a merge because if you're having to develop a new marketing scheme as a way to get your already people who are already members to come to church, there's probably a prop, there's probably something wrong there. And it might be something different for people who've never been a part of worship before. But as we see it in, in the book of Acts, if they can see very clearly how people are taken care of. Within the church, you're going to have 3,000 to join in a day. You're not going to be able to have enough room. You know, uh, it, it was so funny to me when when, when, when people wanted to have uh, discussions and debates about, um, well, we can't go back to church because the governor has said we can only be at 50% capacity. <laughs> I said, did you do you realize that there hadn't been a single Sunday probably in the last 10 years where you had 50% capacity at this church? Our capacity is 209 people. When the last time we had 104.5 people in worship on Sunday? Come on now. But, we, but I said, think about what you're saying. But think about what does that say to us? Is it, is it because we don't have any people in the community that might benefit from a worship in the light of Christ? Absolutely not. There are more people, when you if you come to church, you walk up the street. I've, I've been noticing it since I, I remember when I, when I first started coming to, to, to church uh, at Witherspoon. And it's not unique to Witherspoon, but I noticed it because I, that's when I first noticed all of our brown neighbors. And I will, okay, we, sometimes we couldn't get, there were so many cars, we had to park way down Witherspoon. We had to park down on John Street or somewhere else in order to find a parking space. And it wasn't just because there were so many people here. I now understand it's because all of our churches were worshiping at the same time. So mm -hmm. Mount Pisgah, AME, Witherspoon, and First Baptist were all kind of overlapping. And turned, so everybody was parked uh, at the same time. But I would walk and I was like, wow, there's a lot of people who are just sitting out on the porch, the mm -hmm. who are sitting on the steps of the, 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 the stores. And, and, and in, every, in every place that I've been, when I was at Northern Heights in Selma, that's when they told me to uh, calm down and don't do too much work and stop bringing all these people to church. Because <laughs> I would come early and I would just walk around and I see everybody sitting out on the porch. And I said, come on, get dressed. You know, well, I don't have any church clothes. That's all right. I, my only thing, don't come in your underwear. But, you know, <laughs> you can throw on a shirt, you know, some, some flip-flops. You're good. Come on in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and people on. were like, Pastor, don't, don't, don't be bringing up. But there was more people on the block than we had in church. And this is a small church. We only had 24 people on roll. But I could get more people on the block to come in church on a Sunday morning that we already had of our members who were coming. And that threw some people off. Same thing happened in Birmingham, Westminster Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. I was bringing in drug dealers and drug addicts and prostitutes and people, and they, and they were smelling like weed and, and, and cheap wine, you know, and, and, and when they, when they were speaking in tongues, they were speaking in tongues that were familiar. They were speaking words that, that were not acceptable always in church. One woman even threw up one time in, 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 in the middle of worship because she had had too much to drink on Saturday night. Hmm. But they realized there was something there for them. There for them. Mm -hmm. And if people realize there's something in our worship, there will be an uprising. 
people will come. So often we forget why Jesus came. I mean, if you're already good and you're already perfect and you're already okay, that's not who he came for. He came for those who were lost and sick and who might throw up in church and who might smell bad because they're seeking something that they don't have. And, and you know, those of us who are now been in the church and so-called saved, you know, forever, Oh, we're not doing when we turn ourselves and turn our noses up at those people, we're not being like Jesus. And 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 they said, I, I love this chapter so much when he keeps telling us to be like Jesus. Look at the people that Jesus was with. He wasn't with the people who had all the money and had the all the nice houses and doing all that. He was out with the poor people, the crippled people, the blind people, the hungry people. That's what Jesus was. Amen. I got a question, Reverend. Mm -hmm. uh, your experiences in, in Alabama, Mississippi, down south, uh, are there, do you come in contact with any Quaker churches down there? Any, they had Quaker churches down, down south? I never really, I never really came in contact with Quaker churches until I came up here. Gotcha. I knew a few people who were Quakers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they worked for organizations like the American Friends Service Committee. Um, but I'll say this, I came in contact with very few Presbyterians when I was in the South <laughs> because most of the South is Baptist, uh, Methodist, Pentecostal. They're very small. You know, it's, it's a, it, it, there's not a, an incredible amount of diversity in terms of denominations and, and different traditions. Uh, in um, in certain parts of the country, so but I know a lot of Quakers up here. What I'm thinking about basically, is like my understanding of, of of a Quaker worship is that it's total silence until someone has the word or the spirit of God on him, and then and then then there's uh, verbalization. Yeah, that's, yeah, they, they understanding. Too? Yeah, it is. Like I, I've been in these interfaith groups, and um, and the, and and the Quakers with jokes that don't ask us to lead prayer. Mm -hmm. We all just gonna be sitting here, <laughs> and, and 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 you might, might sit, and, I, and I was like, okay, and we've sat and had a quake lead, and we sat for ten minutes, and then nobody say anything, and that's fine too. It doesn't even have to be until somebody says something. It could be you're waiting to hear what God has to say to you, and it might be just for you. It might be something that for you to share with the group, but. You know, it, it, it is a it is a commitment to science. And, and I think we can incorporate that, too. You know, you there, there have been times when in our prayer calls where I've tried to, to teach that it's not just about the words that we say. Sometimes it's about being silent and listening to see what God has to say to us and yeah. just be still, be still. Sometimes it doesn't have to be competing and have to be shouting and have to be hollering. And I don't go in for any of that. I don't go in for one way or the other way. Right. I think there are many different ways that you yeah. can come into the presence of God, many ways that you can pray. And I've been blessed that some of the most, um, I'll tell you one of the leading um, activists that has been, that was working on Sundiata long before me is a, is a white woman named Bonnie Kerness. I think she actually came on one of the Christian education calls. Mm -hmm. And and Bonnie um, is a part of the American Friends Service Committee. She's been there over 50 years, over 50 years uh, serving. Um, and the Quakers were some of the leading abolitionists. Quakers were active in all kinds of different ways. So even if they were silent in their prayers, they spoke up in so many other ways. And so, you know, it, it, it is a, it, it has a powerful legacy within some of their traditions as well. So we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to wrap up. It's after two now. And so we, we thank you all who are joining for next week. We're going to go to just to the next chapter. So uh, we'll be doing chapter 37 and 37 is a group uprising of partnership psalm 146 matthew 10 16 through 20 11 28 through 30 28 16 through 20 
and the book of Acts chapter 16 verses 11 through 40 the uprising of partnership that's what we'll be reading from we make the road by walking Brian McLaren uh, if you would like to get connected on zoom please leave the information in the chat we'll send you the information you are invited to come you can share your voice directly I give thanks for all of those who are watching from around the country uh, and around the world I appreciate my sisters and brothers and in, in the Caribbean and in Nigeria and in Ghana who check in and watch and join on this Bible study. I know it's later in the evening uh, or early evening for, for, for many of you all. And uh, we, we give thanks for the blessing of this two years. Anybody want to say a final word about our, uh, on our two year anniversary as we close out? Um, we, we've been coming together for two years uh, today. Today is our two year anniversary of this Bible study. Anyone want to reflect on where we've been or where we go from here? Hi, it's Nicole. Um, first of all, I can't believe it's been two years. Uh, we've been focused more on when those of us who gather on morning prayer, it felt like we were more cognizant of that. But um, if there was ever a spiritual one-two punch, it's morning prayer and our Bible study. It is not like any Bible study that I've been to. Usually the Bible studies I go to, it's to kind of feed and uplift your soul, get you through that Wednesday hump day to keep going on. Oh. I feel like I've gone to uh, the best seminary that the country has to offer in terms of getting in close and not going by what people say the Bible says, but learning it for myself. I think there has to be something to be said about this is a Bible study where you read every word. And over two years that we have uh, digested and fed on Acts and Revelation and John and uh, so many, the book of Daniel and processed it and not feeling like necessarily you know, little small students and big teacher who went to ooh, Princeton Theological Seminary, you were you allowed us to think. And to me, the best instructors do just that. They challenge you and they challenge you to think for yourself and by the word of God. Mm -hmm. So to your anniversary, it's just an amazing thing to know that it's two years, we've grown so much, but I just feel like there's so much more that we've learned, that, we, that, that we're going to learn together. Um, and, and we, you know, we're a mighty little tree here, right? But we're growing. And, you know, when I look at the numbers, right? That used to be, it was you, Sharon, me and mommy and Barbara, right? That was our little group. And now look, we're still growing. And so I am grateful that you haven't given up on us, that you have made time because you really have done something wonderful here. And I am so much closer to God because of the Bible study. So thank you, love you. Amen, thank you, Nicole. Um, and why, why you say that, and it's, and it's certainly not just me. I, I also want us, I wanna remind you that one of the reasons why I chose this book is because I did see it as a text that I thought many of those of you who have been a part of this journey could help to lead. I mean, certainly we formatted this in such a way where it's more consistent in terms of how we do it. And uh, I'd like for you all to be thinking about if there's a week coming up, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you now that the, the week of, what would that be? This, this week coming up is what, May the 15th? 15th. Mm -hmm. so, so next week, um the week of may the the no i'll be here i said there's some there's some week coming up soon when i'm not gonna be here I, I, I gotta remember when it is uh it might be in june uh, but even when i'm here i would certainly welcome uh your leadership we do have uh, uh a princeton theological seminary intern uh candace lovelace uh who again we're just blessed she's she's going she's the president the moderator of the Association of Black Seminarians. Um, we had the SGA president uh, in Archangel Antoine this past year. And so Candace is gonna be with us. And so 
a part of what she will be doing is, is sharing in the teaching. But I want to invite you all to think about, uh, you, you can look ahead, you can see some of the lessons, you see the weeks that we're doing, and if there's a week that you see in the book that you would like to teach, uh, I, I would encourage you, because that's, that's also one of the ways that we learn. One of the ways that we're also able to learn is that we're able to be put into a position where we can teach, where we can share. And I learn from you all as well. I mean, the, the perspectives and the feedback and the things that you pay attention to and catch that I may miss is really valuable for me. And so I like the fact that we do this. Everybody's on the screen all at once. It's not, as, it's not in the webinar mode where no one can say anything and you just have the speaker or the panel that is interactive, that we can talk uh, and we can learn together. And I think that that's how the ecclesia, that first century church, uh, they went to the apostles, they asked questions, they listened, but they, but they, were, they were living together and worshiping together and loving together. And that's, that's who I want us to be uh, as a church. And I say as a church, it's not about an individual church or membership role. I know I've referenced my particular church that I'm assigned to at this point uh, several times, but certainly we are one people serving one God with one destiny. And I consider you my sister, my brother. I consider you to be a part of this fellowship and a part of this church wherever you are, um, wh whatever place that you may be, whenever and, 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 and wherever. And so know that uh, I uh, am excited to see what God may do in the next couple of years. Um, I'm excited about our new intern because she has a specialization uh, in technology uh, in terms of, of uh, podcasting, uh, in terms of, of helping us with being able to figure out how to do things more effectively and reach people in different ways. And so um, I am um, excited how she's going to help us and help me to be able to serve you and to serve God better. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the blessing on this day. We love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to seek after your will and your way. Thank you for all of those who have gathered today and those who gathered virtually over Facebook and YouTube and those who may watch later, Lord God. This is an amazing word that you have given us and for us to have had two years of coming together and one bite and one sip at a time, trying to digest its meaning and its power and its purpose has truly been an anointing. So we say to ourselves, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh, our souls, with all that is within us. Bless the Lord our God's holy name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together and say together. Amen. 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 Blessings, everyone. I have to leave. Bye, Barbara. Bye, Barbara. Bye.